Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the 142nd CHI Forum to commemorate the opening of the CHI's new research arm, the Korea Accounting Research Institute, or CARI. I'm Do Kyung A from the CHI, and thank you for joining us today. In celebration of the launch of the CARI, um, Professor Jacob Sol has graciously joined us from all the way from the United States. Professor Sol is a renowned professor at the University of Southern California, specializing in history, philosophy, and accounting. With numerous awards and um, publications to his name, um, he's a regular contributor to major media outlets such as the New York Times. As the key event today, we are thrilled to present Professor Sol's lecture on his thought-provoking book, The Reckoning, Financial Accountability and the Rise and Fall of Nations, followed by a panel discussion. I trust this will be an enlightening and meaningful experience for all of us. Before we welcome Professor Sol, I'd like to ask President Jung Soo Han of the Korean Accounting Association to give his welcoming remarks. Please welcome Dr. Han. Ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests, I'm Jung Soo Han. I am the president of Korean Accounting Association. First of all, I sincerely thank everyone who joined us today for the inaugural, I mean, initiation seminar of the Korean Accounting uh, Research Institute. I'm also thankful for having the opportunity to address you with this commemorative speech. Since its establishment in 1999, the Korean Accounting Association, I mean, Korean Accounting Standards Board, the KASB, has achieved remarkable milestones over the years that would not have been possible without its existence. However, there is an aspect that warrants a little bit reflection. While the KS, KASB began as the name of Korea Accounting Research Institutes, its research endeavors may have fallen a little bit short in certain areas, partic particularly in the past decade since the adoption of IFRS, much of its research has been limited. However, as the financial reporting environment changes, the form and the direction of its research must, must also evolve. In the past, a priori logic was more than enough, but nowadays, empirical research based on data is more it has become more significant. Accounting standards were our own concern, but nowadays, sustainability criteria are also crucial. Moreover, more research is needed not only on standards, but on also reporting environments, such as oversight systems and infrastructures. Some may question why do we need research when we are using international standards? I believe this question misses the mark. As everyone here would, would concur with me, using international standards necessitates even more research. Active participation in the development of international standards require systematic, logical, and data-based research. And also our goal extends more participation in, in, in standard setting, I mean, I mean, it I mean, encompasses the collaborative effort to create better standards and better reporting environment. Moreover, the field of accounting and sustainability are the areas where various stakeholders have sharply conflict interest. I believe the Korean Accounting Research Institute has its strength precisely in this aspect, being an organization dis de dis de detached from any specific interest group, the institute can conduct unbiased, neutral, and independent research. I genuinely believe that the Korea Accounting Research Institute can significantly contribute not only to accounting development in Korea, but also on a global scale. <clears throat> I'm sorry. In these aspects, the significance of today's inauguration of the Korean Accounting Institute, Research Institute cannot be overstated. Today, as she said, we are honored to have Professor Jacob Sol a distinguished scholar in history, philosophy, and accounting from the University of Southern California, Southern California. 
Professor Sol will deliver a lecture, the, a, the reckoning, financial accountability, and the rise and fall of nations. Despite his busy schedule, Professor Sol came to Korea for joining us for this seminar. His presence and valuable insights are deeply appreciated. I also want to express my gratitude to Professor Kwak Pyong Jin, uh, who graciously chaired today's discussion, and Professors Han Seung Yeop, Lee Kyung Yoon, and Lee Sang Hoo, who willingly participated in the seminar as discussants. I'd like my deepest appreciation. I'd like to extend my deepest appreciation for their contribution this, to this enriching event. I'm delighted that such a visit, I mean vital, Korea County Research Institute is embarking on its journey. Although the institute begins with small number, number of individuals, I'm confident that its impact will soon be substantial. Finally, in terms of research and education, a lot of collaboration between the institute and Korean Accounting Association will be very very important. I eagerly anticipate mutual growth through cooperative efforts. Once again, and lastly, I wish the Korea County Research Institute the best of luck and also a great success in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Han, for the welcoming remarks. Now I'd like to invite Ms. Hyundak Choi, the inaugural head of the newly established CARI, to share her opening address. Please welcome Ms. Choi. Uh, good afternoon. I am Hyundak Choi, head of uh, yeah. I'm Hyundak Choi. Uh, head of the Korea Accounting Research uh, Institute, KARI. I'm honored to be here with you today at this meaningful seminar commemorating the official opening of the KARI, uh, which took place on 8th March. I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude, especially to Professor Jacob. Uh, who has uh, traveled a long way to be here today, and to Professor Byung Jin Kwak, uh, Seung Yeop Han, uh, Kyung Yoon Lee, and uh, Dr. Sang Ho Lee for reading a discussion later on. Currently, the corporate financial reporting environment is experiencing rapid change. The significance of uh, intangible asset is gaining prominence with accelerated advancement in technologies such as uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, artificial intelligence. Complex financial instruments are evolving and the discussions are on the way about integrated reporting, ranking, uh, environmental and climate information with financial reporting. To adapt continuously to such environmental changes and propose new alternatives as a global thought leader in accounting standards, uh, research equivalent to R&D in the corporate realm becomes imperative. This necessitates the specialization of research organizations. The Korea Accounting Institute seeks to revitalize Korea accounting research by the establishment of the KARI. The KARI aims to concentrate this research capacity on three key areas. Firstly, through pioneering and innovative in foundational research in financial reporting, we will provide a theoretical foundation that underpins the revision of accounting standards. Secondly, through practical research related to accounting and sustainability standards, we will provide evidence-based support for standard revisions by demonstrating their impact on corporate decision-making and economic outcomes. Thirdly, 
through institutional research on Korea's financial uh, reporting and the infrastructure, we will propose the design of the financial reporting infrastructure that serves as the foundation for a transparent, efficient, and a sustainable economy. Based on such research efforts, we will endeavor to communicate the significance of research to expert academia and the general public through education and publication. Moreover, through international academic and institutional exchanges, we will strive to position Korea accounting as a global thought leader uh, aiming to be at the forefront of change. Marking a meaningful starting point for the KARI, we eagerly anticipate the Professor Jacob Sol's lecture today titled The Reckoning, Financial Accountability, and the Rise and the Fall of Nations to provide profound insights into the present and the future of accounting research. Once again, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to everyone who has joined us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Choi, for the remarks. Now, it is with great pleasure that I welcome our distinguished guest, Professor Jacob Saul, to give his lecture on his mind-expanding book, The Reckoning, Financial Accountability, and the Rise and Fall of Nations. Please join me in welcoming Professor Saul. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jung Suhan, um, for having me here for this lecture. I'm very honored. Thank you to Dr. Han Yi, who is not here today, who organized this. And thank you to the Korean Accounting Institute. It's an immense pleasure to be here. Um, I, it's my first trip to Korea after having spent much time in East Asia. I'm, I just arrived, and I have to say I'm, I'm overwhelmed and impressed and blown away by everything I've seen. This country is so amazing, and actually, um, studying the Korean economy uh, helped me actually come up with this, one of my newest books, which is very, very much based on thinking about the way the Korean economy emerged and how the Korean, let's say, market works, which is very, very complicated and does not fit into many Western narratives of how wealth is created and maintained. Um, so this is actually a Western history, this book, of economics and the market done from, I would say, an East Asian standpoint, particularly inspired by the achievements of South Korea, uh, which are grand and still quite challenging. But what I wanted to speak about with you today um, is actually going back to my older book and to this new book that we've just put out, which I'll be discussing tomorrow, which is called Public Net Worth, which is kind of a continuation of the reckoning, but designed to actually move into the world of policy today. Um, because what happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago is still happening now, which is a constant struggle to actually harness accounting tools for government, let alone for private entities, but for government. Um, it's one of the few inventions, accrual or double entry accounting, which we have not necessarily improved upon. In fact, the main challenge remains simply to use it. <laughs> you would think it's not rocket science, but as I will explain a bit today and more tomorrow, it has proved incredibly difficult for humans to do. Um, so this is, yes, this is the new book, and that's the, uh, that's the uh, English edition. So I'm really interested in these questions. What makes, you know, what makes nations succeed and fail? And I think Korea is such an interesting, such an interesting example because I think Koreans think about this all the time because Korea has been through so much, so many different challenges that actually I don't even know them all. I've studied them, they've been explained to me. But Korea, I think, is really unique in all the different challenges it's bounced back from to emerge with all the problems it faces today, 
still as this leading economic nation. There's just no question about that. Um, and that's really extraordinary. So this is an important place to study. And obviously for me to be here is absolutely key to actually just see it, to walk down the street and meet Koreans and see, see things just working is really extraordinary to me. I have to, I have to admit to you. Um, and so what I wanted to do was kind of talk to you about a sort of old talk that I've given from The Reckoning, but which has kind of evolved and is also focused on this idea, not just on how accounting is absolutely essential to, and I would say like it's prime, it's one of the first things you think about when you wanna build a nation is actually state accounting. You can't really have a functioning state without good accounting, let alone complex economic capitalistic institutions. But I'm also really interested in explaining that from the beginning, sustainability and good government we're always at the forefront of the creation of accounting and the use of accounting in government. And I kind of want to explain that today, how great accounting pioneers in early Europe were thinking in terms which today we're just kind of rediscovering. And I do find it, once again, humans are odd in that we discover things, we lose them, and we have to rediscover them again. And that's also a very human trait. So I wanted to take us back to Europe in 1600 when um, Holland was per capita the richest country. This is a little country. Um, it's the Netherlands essentially. And so what you had was these, these were where the Habsburg family came from. These are all the lowlands, okay? This is Belgium today, Luxembourg. And this, is, this part here is Holland. And as you can see, it was basically underwater. So in many ways, this is even with Venice, more so than Venice, this is in the West, the kind of first, I would say really modern state because it's a state built not only on Republican government and financial government, but also on engineering. And that's something to think about. In the 1100s, farmers in Holland started using engineering to pull land out of the water. This changed the social makeup of the country, and I think this is something that could be interesting to Koreans because many of the farmers who pulled land out of the water were not underneath the control of a lord. So they gave them a certain amount of freedom because they were not in an old feudal structure. And how did they do that? They did it by this system called the polder system. And so this actually, when you fly into Holland, you can actually see what it looked like almost a thousand years ago when you get these fields that were pulled out by pumps, dikes, levees, and seawalls, um, you start, they're actually creating wealth. Now, it turns out that accounting is absolutely key to that. Every one of these areas, administratively, these water areas, were actually controlled by water works, and those water works had to be managed incredibly well. Um, Sorry. And for that to actually happen, they started using accounting, which meant many of these were run by noblemen, but a lot of them were run by village people. And those people all had to sort of take turns in managing these institutions. They would manage religious institutions, but this was an engineering institution. And what I think, some people have argued with me on this, we can only hypothesize one of, and I actually have read some evidence to show that the stakes were incredibly high in the public financial management of the waterworks. Because if you didn't manage the water well, you died. So there were really important stakes. By the way, today the Dutch are still the best all around water managers in the world. Interestingly enough, they're struggling because the very thing that keeps the sea from coming in is using the physics of fresh water to push the sea out. And of course, now it's going dry as the climate completely changes. So if anyone has any doubts, just go talk to the water, um, the water engineers in Holland, and they're struggling with global warming in a way that they have not had to do forever, essentially. Now, these lands were nominally, or actually officially, underneath the Habsburg king of Spain, Philip II. Philip II was a very, very powerful king. But he was also, and I think I can fairly say this, kind of a religious fanatic. So he believed that he was the protector of Christendom, in particular, 
not only against the Turks, but also against Protestants. He was a Catholic king. And those lands in Holland were the richest holdings in the Spanish Empire. Let me just see if, do I have a map actually of the Spanish Empire? I don't. But as you, I think, know, the Spanish Empire spanned around the world. And with all the silver and gold coming from the New World, and this is something that an accountant can tell you, which is really important, is that extraction wealth will not earn you as much as actual cre creation wealth. So actually, industry is overall going to create a richer country than an extractive economy will. Even though we all still live on extraction, it's not that sustainable, and it's never been that good for anybody you know, just talk to people in Central and South America. It didn't work out that well. Um, so what he does is he taxes the Netherlands higher than any place in his kingdom because that's where all the money is coming from. Um, he's also mad at them for being Protestant. He feels that they're heretics and they should be punished. How does he deal with this? Now, remember, these towns in, in Holland, many of them were free cities run by citizens who had actually did not have the yoke of feudalism on them immediately precisely because of this ancient holder system. And many of the noblemen had to deal with engineering and were actually earning money from a commercial market that by the 16th century, the Dutch had become so good at creating industry that they started using their farmland not for food, but for industrial products. And I want you to think of that. Agriculture does not actually make rich economies industry does. You need agriculture, but they got so good at it. And by the way, Holland today remains incredibly productive agriculturally. They got so good at it that they started importing food and using their actual, a lot of their land to create products that they would use for industrial creation. They revolt against Philip. This leads to the Dutch Revolt or the 80 Years War when Philip comes and starts attacking his own ancestral lands for having a separate religion and for not paying them these taxes. Now, one other thing I want to note to you is, I'm, is that, well, I'm going to show you, these were not just kind of normal people in 16th century Europe. They were very, very unusual, the Dutch culturally. He sends the Duke of Alba, by the way, still today, just about the richest family in Spain. If you go to Madrid right now, they've opened up all their palaces. They have the greatest collections in all of Spain. For me, it's a little hard to take because I know where the wealth came from. Um, it came from this, the Spanish Fury. This is called bad government. Now, in 1576, arguably, even compared to places in Asia, and that's saying a lot in 1576, Antwerp was probably the richest city in the world. All the goods of the Spanish Empire were coming and Portuguese empires, were coming into this city. It was also a city of financial expertise. It probably had more accountants than any place on earth, even more than in Northern Italy. That meant it was a city of financial managers, not just goods. You had industry and goods. So this is an extraordinary thing. It's a step up from the Italian city-states, okay? And that's saying a lot. This is the richest place possibly in the world per capita wealth creation. It's in his empire, and this is what he does to it because they refuse to pay the taxes and they won't, actually these guys are Catholic, mostly in Antwerp. He burns the city hall, and as you can see, he just massacres all the civilians. This is what's called bad governance, okay? I'm gonna show you how this connects to accounting. Bad governance. This is not what you want to do. And this is, by the way, but this is what repressive governments do all the time. And it's sort of interesting, as we have backsliding on democracy around the world, I don't know what people think they're going to get. That's what you get, okay? When you get extremist governments or you get non-democratic governments, that's how you solve problems when you don't negotiate. That is kind of what democracy is all about, right? Um, more and more, look, bad governments, bad for business. So essentially, this attack slows things down. In the meantime, the northern Netherlands break away. Why? Engineering. They just flood everything, and the Spanish can't get to them, and they're protected. And they create the Dutch Republic in 1581. Now, this is a moment. I want you to, oh, this is really important. I want you to explain this. There are 100,000 people living in Antwerp 
um, at this exact moment in 1576, 100,000 people flee to Amsterdam. Amongst them, who do you think left? The accountants. So this incredibly, back then, by the way, being an accountant, if you went to school in Holland, you would go and you would take humanist lessons in Latin, in ancient literature, in ancient theory, Greek and Roman theory. You would um, take music, you would take mathematics. And then, as I've studied, in many places, the cities, the government, would pay for accounting masters because they knew what they needed to build their market. The government actually needed to educate its citizens to do this specific high-level financial management. And I actually have descriptions of people leaving the Latin school and walking into the accounting school. I want you to imagine the level of education. Humanists who knew history, philosophy, physics, and who could do public speaking, politics, and they could audit the books. That's a really big deal, okay? That's the population you don't want to leave. Look at what he's doing to them, okay? They didn't understand wealth. And so they leave to Amsterdam. That's a crazy thing. Um, once again, what makes societies succeed and, and fail? Expertise, accountability, and an awareness of moral issues. The Dutch Republic is born in 1581. It's called the Lion because it's so rich and it's really powerful. Um, it's got this incredible fleet. It's got a powerful army. Um, it is also in the well, I think I'll explain this. It's going to start creating capitalism. But it's got something else that's really interesting. Even decades before this, people from the lowlands thought about life in terms of accounting. And this is something that's so important. This idea of accounting literacy, of bringing accounting into every decision that you make. And we find, at least history has shown, this is really, really important. This guy here is... Tommaso Portinari, he is the actual head partner of the Medici Bank in Bruges. He has this painting painted, ironically, before he lends the Duke of Burgundy 100,000 florins, which is like a king's ransom. And you guys are accountants. I'm sure you give the advice. Never loan money to someone named Charles the Bold. Never loan money to like a, a prince with armor and a big beard. He will just not pay you back, okay? That's just like good financial sense. This painting was stolen by Polish pirates and is still in Gdansk today. The first lawsuit of this kind was over this painting, which was stolen and is still not in Italy. He actually brings down the Medici Bank in part with this loan. But look at him, putting him and his wife in this picture of the, this is the last judgment. This is the book of life and death where you, you actually have the final judgment where God does a moral accounting and you're either sent to heaven or hell. It's amazing that he had this painted. And then, of course, I don't know which side he went to, but I know where the Medici wanted to send him. This is a portrait of a merchant from 1530. Um, this is one of the most famous Flemish portraits of the Renaissance. It's in the Metropolitan Museum of New York. It's considered one of the great masterworks. A lot of historians became interested in this because they thought it was a picture of early computing. Now, the thing is, is most people don't know anything about accounting. Yes, in Latin, computare means accounting. This is an accounting painting. He's doing double entry accounting. As you can actually see, um, the books are there. He's rich, he's proud, he's wearing ermine, he's wearing jewels, and I think he's a Catholic too. We've been told that Protestants created Capitalism, it's just not true. Italian Catholics, even these Flemish Catholics did it. There is, I don't think Max Weber was right. I do not actually believe there's a religious story. I think there's a cultural story. And Korea can show that too, right? Um, it might not be your religion that makes you rich. It might actually be a general culture. This is a general culture of accounting that starts quite early, 1514. Look at this. This is the money lender and his wife. I want you to notice that the woman is there helping the man do the accounting. And look in the back. There's your, there's your computer, your, your double entry system with the three books. They're painting the technology. They're proud of it. And look, it's also showing them with money, this is very unusual, with a book of hours, they're actually being pious while doing accounting. And they're showing off their skills in accounting. This is a masterwork. So your biggest works of art, 
are now actually accounting related works. I want you to think for a moment if you walked into KPMG or Deloitte and they actually had accounting masterworks. Now, I want you to think about this because these guys did it. They were bold enough, bolder than Charles the Bold. They actually were bold enough to paint accounting. This one has transformed it. Look at the books in the back again. Now the wife's actually doing the books. It's no longer a book of hours. She's doing the accounting. By the way, just a maybe little East Asian message. The more you get women involved with economic production, the richer you get. So that might be uh, another thing to think about. These, these guys don't just brag about their accounting. They warn about the dangers that hubris in accounting brings. And again, I want you to think if one of the big four, actually, if you walked into the accounting firm and they said, we're the best at accounting, but watch out, it can always go wrong. <laughs> these guys were doing it. This painting, this within you know, Christian messaging looks like the serpent, a serpent of temptation. Some people think this guy's Jewish. I'm not so sure, but we can see something's wrong. There are the books, okay? This is um, a, a, a sugello. This is the biggest form of money you have. These are Flor F florins from Florence that are sealed in wool and then with, um, with wax, so you can carry a lot of money. They're doing the books, but something's wrong. This is the most extraordinary, one of the two most extraordinary accounting paintings I've ever seen. This is the finest representation of, of double entry accounting that I've seen. Look at the work on those books, you guys. 1540, this is really early, okay? But all is not right. The books look okay, but the hats are too big, and obviously they look like they're insane. Why? The hubris, this is a Christian message of we're the best, but obviously, as soon as you think you're the best, you have gone into a dangerous territory. You always have to be self-critical, and you have to be aware that this kind of hubris can be extremely dangerous. I would love to see this painting in the front office of every major accounting firm. We're the best at what we do, but we all need to be careful. I think that's actually a great business message. Obviously, they don't. But I think it's an amazing message. These guys are having masterworks. These are the greatest works of art of the time, painted showing this. This is in Bruges. If you haven't been to Bruges, in Europe, there are a few cities to visit, Venice, Rome, Paris. Bruges is actually one of them, Amsterdam. It's absolutely amazing. Madrid, Portugal, there are many. But this is an amazing painting. This is in the museum in Bruges. You can't see the other side. On one side of the painting, there are all the buildings that he's built for his city, hospitals, churches, um, uh, uh, retirement homes. But on this side, he's the rich merchant trying to balance his books. And you can see, once again, the tools of double entry are all here. This is, it's darkened, but this is, those are all the books. And those are all the receipts. And here he is, and he cannot balance his books because this guy owes him money. And this shroud is not very good news. When death's shroud is covering you, it means you're dead. So, the only person who can balance his books is death. And he's showing that he's aware that in spite of all of his money, that there are forces bigger than him in life. And so he needs to feel accountable all the time. This is remarkable level, you guys. Imagine this culture in which accounting is so important that the most important people show off their accounting and then say, as good as my accounting is, I'm actually telling you that I don't have the hubris to think it will solve all my problems. This is an amazing level of awareness, which I, I tried to figure this out. Um, again, this is, this is probably before, well, this is actually in a Catholic city, so this doesn't have to do with Protestantism. This just has to do with these attitudes that are quite extraordinary. This is the allegory to commerce actually made after the fall of Antwerp. This is an amazing thing. Here's Antwerp, the center of world trade, all the boats coming in. There's Mars, the god of war and of business. There's the double entry accounting system. There's the ledger. And here is a pictorial manual of double entry bookkeeping. The, the first and only one I've ever seen. It actually explains it well enough to learn it. And because double entry is so hard, as many of you know, having the pictorial version is actually incredibly helpful. This was a really important image. 
And this is the allegory to commerce, to wealth, and to the greatness of this city, Antwerp, which by this time has kind of fallen. By this time, Amsterdam has become the center of, um, of now of the Dutch Republic. It's the capital and also the center of this commercial world. Now, I want you to remember these guys have taken into account how the environment works. They've taken into account morality. They're thinking about all these terms all around accounting. Simon Stevin is a commoner. He goes to the university, and this is something that actually happens in the Dutch Republic. You can get a commoner who's good. He goes to the university. He's the leading, one of the leading humanists in Amsterdam at the time. He's an expert in physics. He's an expert in ancient Greek. He's an expert in uh, water management. He's head of the water management board, and he's also an accountant, and he's really good at accounting. And there's another thing. He is roommates in college or friends with the Stadtholder, the prince who is the overseer of the republic. So he's friends with the prince, and he writes this, in, whoops, he writes this incredible book, um, New Instructions um, on how to keep good accounting books and how to do um, a good accounting in the Italian manner. And in this book, he goes on to explain that every citizen needs to know accounting. Most of all, the head of the state needs to know accounting so that the head of state can actually audit the books and manage the books through double entry, manage the state through double entry. That's like an incredible, I mean, think about that for a minute. He's recommending this. Well, it just so happens that there's Prince Morris of Nassau, the Prince of Orange. Um, it just so happens that some colleagues found, I think in 2006, his double entry ledgers in The Hague in the museum. And those books, th anyone here remember how to do accounting by hand? Those are beautiful books, aren't they? I mean, these are really nice double entry account books. He didn't keep them, but there's evidence in the books that he was auditing them. <laughs> it's just like completely amazing, right? These are the things that, again, not that many people care about, but if you understand the importance of accounting and statecraft, and I hope someday we get to the point that this becomes something that's in a Dutch museum, seen as one of the great achievements of Holland, instead of being some obscure slide that I show, okay? So we know that he was able to um, audit books, and that's really important because in 1602, capitalism reaches its next step. The Dutch East India Company is formed as a partnership between the government and private investors. Um, we used to think it was a completely private company. It wasn't. We found the internal memos. The state's behind it. It's overseeing it. But it does have private investors, and it is now setting out to be the biggest commercial success in the world, primarily in things like slavery, but I'll talk about that. At the same time, it's also going to be the motor behind the invention of the modern stock exchange. In the same year, the Amsterdam Stock Exchange opens. This is not a bourse for exchange. Is it a place where you sell pieces of paper that are representative of wealth? You have to understand this gets back into this moral aspect. Why on earth would human beings agree to accept wealth on a piece of paper? That takes a huge level of trust, right? And that trust is based, these are my hypotheses, but they, I, it's hard to argue, I think, against them. I think you can, but it's, it's easy to argue back. Why would you believe that these guys are, that the value on that paper is real, it's because almost everyone you meet is fluent in accounting. Everyone can audit and you can audit too. So this, this basically circle of trust, and this is really important, right? We talk about ESG, good governments, good governance of governments, but the good governance of companies too. Um, I mean, we can look at, uh, uh, Major companies, even today in Korea, don't put everything on the books, right? We know that in America, um, when I was writing The Reckoning a long time ago, a whistleblower came to me with a major American company's books and said, I'm the chief accountant. 
all these liabilities are off the book and it's completely legal. What do I do? I said, I, I don't know. I can't help you with this, but it's fascinating, right? So assets are always hidden. How can you find that out? By understanding books. And if you're a good auditor, you can go into books. They're history, really, right? And you can smell things in those books. I've had friends who are investors go into companies and they look the people in the eye while doing the books and they say, I smell a hidden, ass, a hidden liability here. And then they don't make the investment and save their careers. And it takes not just being able to be able to read, to audit historically with intuition. That's very important. But then it's the personal meeting with the people keeping the books as well, right? The stock exchange is born. This is all happening at once. Now, the Dutch East India Company is getting resources from the North Sea, whale oil, um, fur of polar bears. Again, stuff we shouldn't be doing now because we can't do that anymore. It's creating factories. It's enslaving people. It's running the slave trade. Um, and they're, they're very explicit about it. On these boats, we're taking our slaves, we're getting rich, okay? Not only are we bringing slaves back, we're bringing stuff from around the world and we're getting rich on this stuff. Now, as I explained in The Reckoning, they tr and, and I think I also explained it in this new book, they try to do double entry um, books for the Dutch East India Company, but it's really, really hard to take this massive global company and put the whole thing with a comprehensive balance sheet, but they try and do it. They're just unable to even find the people to do all the different levels of bookkeeping. And that's the other thing that's a kind of modern wonder that we now have the capacity to do that. Um, here's the Dutch enjoying their wealth. I must say, in spite of all that wealth, the Dutch do not create a great cuisine. That's another thing we could talk about after this, how you can become so rich and not have good food. Um, this leads to another thing. Um, does this system lead to free markets? Hugo Grotius is seen as the father of free markets, um, at least from a legal standpoint. He's one of the creators of natural law theory. He writes this book, um, The, the, the free, Freedom of the Seas in 1609. A lot of this book is actually about the Dutch right to be able to invade the Spanish and Portuguese imperial sphere. So, it's very interesting how morality plays out. And this book has always been seen as an incredibly moral book, but it was an also, also a book to protect imperial interests of the Dutch. But the Dutch become really, really rich. And this, if you go to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, in the old days, they've remodeled it. But when you used to walk into the Rijksmuseum, this was the first painting you saw. This is representative of the Republican wealth of Holland. And I can guarantee to you that in 1642, most of those leading citizens could audit their books. For whatever terrible things they did around the world, they became per capita the most productive, rich merchants in the world, and they could all do accounting. And they were also aware, interestingly enough, of the moral aspects of accounting. How do we know this? They write about it, they talk about it. By the way, we, we have evidence that bricklayers that common people, the most common people, were able to do double entry bookkeeping at this time. This is how you get a rich society. This moral aspect is important to trust and capitalism. If you know everyone's keeping good books and inviting accountable audits, if you have a transparent country, essentially, then you have more trust. And I believe this is one of the reasons that the first stock exchange basically arrives in Holland. My friend Eric Ketelar, who um, was the former chief archivist of Holland, um, of the Netherlands, found all these paintings in the back rooms of all these institutions, and he counted the ones. It turns out there, and these are only the ones that survive, hundreds of paintings of Dutch managers showing, so these are all people who are running institutions, showing the public that they're keeping double entry books, and they're inviting them to be audited. I want you to think about that for a minute. Could you imagine just, again, can you imagine Samsung giving a painting of the, the chief officers of Samsung sitting around their books, inviting the public to audit the books? I'm just saying, these guys were doing that. There are reasons not to do it, actually. I get that. But this is an extraordinary 
cultural phenomenon here, okay? They're not just, there are hundreds of these paintings. Look at this. Again, those fingers, come on, come here. Look, we're keeping the books. Come audit us. We're in, we challenge you to audit us. <laughs> I mean, this is bold, you guys. This is an accountable society. Oh, what's this? Women in executive roles, keeping account books, inviting audits, okay? This is another way you get really rich, all right, is having, is basically taking um, advantage of your entire brain force of your society. So women in leading roles, the accounting industry, which is now has a shortage, still doesn't have very many women working in it. So this is something we still are struggling with, this very image. Um, now, one of the interesting things, though, is as we move into the, 18, the 1700s, the accounting starts getting bad, but they keep, um, they keep producing these works. So once Holland starts declining, these works turn into propaganda, which is so interesting. That's a very like corporate move. Like once your corporate brand is sinking, you keep producing the propaganda of your once great stage of accountability. So these are really powerful paintings. We're, I'm saying almost every major institution is keeping, is producing one of these paintings. And for at least 100 years, they are a representation of reality. Um, the Dutch Republic, this is the, basically the prime minister of the Dutch Republic. He is... Uh, fluent in accounting and physics, again, a golden age. Um, and his one of his main thinkers is this guy, Peter de la Cour, who writes this remarkable book, which is essentially a national balance sheet. It has a list of all the assets of the country, and then it lists the actual um, liabilities that the country faces. It's unbelievable. But he says that there's a moral aspect to this. He says, you couldn't do this in a monarchy. You couldn't do this in a, in a place with an absolute monarchy. We are a republic of laws, and therefore, we're able to do this kind of business and have this kind of accountability that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So this is an incredible statement of the morality of this accountable society as literally the I mean, a proto-democratic open society statement. It's an amazing book. However, life has a way of often not working out. Prince Morris's son doesn't like this and basically kills DeWitt, goes after Peter de la Cour, and the DeWitt brothers get hung up like pigs and cut up with their guts taken out and put into shopkeeper windows. So for all of that, it doesn't really work out, okay? However, um, uh, Prince William ends up king of England after this. So he falls on his feet, but Dutch republicanism fails. Um, more, more or less making Peter de la Cour's idea that you need this moral society that's open and has laws and accountable kind of a reality, um, showing not only that Holland didn't have it and had these problems, and then ironically, Prince William goes to England and creates a more accountable society in England. But that leads us back to this portrait of the merchant in 1530. And this portrait just kind of fascinates me, this idea of a society in which wealthy people see their wealth as based on good financial management, in which they show it off, and which they warn about the dangers of not doing accounting or thinking that it's infallible, but also this kind of idea that there's a moral message in all of this, of balance, of accountability, of openness, and I would say not necessarily democratic, but this idea of having an open society, having a society of open books, and having, this is an incredible concept, the concept of the audit as part of your society. Oh, there's one story I didn't tell you. Did I tell you this? That I just wanna bounce back. This is absolutely key, and it's like something I'd like to finish up with because I think it's really, really important. In 16, what is it, 21, the Dutch East India Company starts suffering losses. This is a fascinating story, okay? And you have a, the first shareholders revolt. Some of the shareholders are dishonest, but others are legitimate. They say, look, we've gone from 18% returns down to three or 6%. We hear rumors of um, price fixing, of hoarding, of embezzlement, and of actually 
bad bookkeeping. They go to Prince Morris to actually audit the book. So I want you to think about a society in which citizens, the first thing you have a problem, they say, I want an audit. In America, you want a lawsuit. They never ask for an audit. Audits are smarter than lawsuits. That's where you really scare people when you audit them. Believe me, I don't want to get audited, right? Who wants to be audited, okay? <laughs> it's a nightmare. So what happens is Prince Moritz actually, they call for a reckoning like merchants would do or like God does in, in the last judgment. It's like a remarkable statement. And basically, Prince Moritz, where did he go? Was he back here? Prince Morris actually can do it. And he says, yes, I will audit the books. I can do it. But he says, look, here's the problem. I can't do an open audit because auditing the books of the East India Company will show our military secrets, but also our industrial secrets. You're going to have to trust me to do the audit. And do you know what happens? The public trusts him. He does the audit. The audit is good. And the Dutch East India Company, for better or for worse, goes back to 18% returns for 130 years. A lot of that's slavery, so I understand that that's not necessarily a good thing. But the management side of that is absolutely spectacular, and so is the government side. Imagine a society in which the head of state can actually audit the books of the biggest company, and the public trusts the head of state. This is literally where capitalism came from. So when we're thinking about our crises of capitalism and our crises of democracy that we're all struggling with right now, I do think accounting should be front and center just like it was. And that brings us to, the, to this idea that ESG, moral sustainability, governmental matters really, really matter. They mattered back then and they matter still after all of these paintings, they still matter today. So, we're stuck with the same questions they had in the 16th century. Um, again, leading accounting associations are facing crises. They're going to be facing AI, which is going to do a lot of the accounting work, facing crises of democracy, and facing the constant problem that governments still do not keep um, comprehensive balance sheets. Why is that a problem? Because Look, I mean, if you look at global warming and you look at everything we have, we look at everything from debt to aging populations, we're going to have to manage our resources better. We're going to have to deal with our liabilities. We're going to have to deal with our assets. By the way, you can fly over South Korea and see all those new, brand new buildings over uh, south of Seoul, right? New factories, new train lines. Are those going to work if it gets 10 degrees hotter, right? and we have super heat waves. I can tell you from the heat waves I experienced in Europe this summer, maybe not. So we're gonna have to start managing things incredibly well if we're gonna deal with this situation. For that, accounting is going to have to change. We're gonna have to have accountants who can make pub the, the case to leaders and to the public how important their work is. They're going to have to take a more public role. That might be, it's very dangerous, and I, I understand that from accounting leaders, who just want to go do the books, do not want to be in leadership positions. I think that is the only way accounting not only will survive as a business, but also will help us survive in a time of scarcity and resource and climate problems and possibly bigger democratic immediate problems which face us all, which I would assume Koreans will, would think about given the neighborhood that they live in on planet Earth, right? So we're back to these questions. I now leave the floor to you to help me answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Saul, for the insightful perspectives. Um, now let us proceed to the panel discussion on the topic. I would like to ask Professor Pyeongjin Kwak and the panelists to come forward, please. Moderating the panel is Professor Pyeongjin Kwak of Kaist University. Professor Kwak is also currently a visiting fellow at the CARI. Professor Kwak, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. It's uh, my honor to be here. Uh, especially thank you for uh, thank you, Professor uh, Jacob Saul uh, for giving a lecture about the 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 creating wealth and uh, becoming rich. At the center of it, there is an accounting. 
The, his lecture is specifically focused on the Holland uh, uh, from 15th to 17th centuries. But uh, his book talks about not only uh, Holland, uh, uh, Italy, uh, Great Britain, France, and United States. Um, <coughs> I, I also thank <coughs> these three uh, panelists uh, about uh, accepting the <laughs> discussion positions because this is not a typical discussion uh, like uh, 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 discussion on the uh, typical uh, accounting research papers. Uh, I, I guess this is quite dif uh, difficult task. Uh, but uh, their uh, discussion is, I guess, not only based on this given uh, lectures uh, after reading whole book, I guess. So from the, the uh, uh, there are three uh, discussants. Uh, Sung Yap Han from uh, Ihua University and uh, Kyung Yun Lee from Hanguk, Un Hanguk University of uh, Foreign Studies and uh, Sang Ho Lee uh, from Korean uh, Capital Market Institute. Uh, please, uh, uh, Sung Yap Lee, you go first. Uh, can you show my presentation? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Singyap Han from Iha Women's University. Uh, first of all, I'm really happy and honored to have a chance to discuss about today's Jacob Salter presentation. Uh, to be honest, I'm a really, really big fan of his book. Uh, you may wonder, this might be a sort of formality or flattering, but I mean it, because uh, it was 19, uh, 2018 at Doctor Consortium when I was first introduced to this book. So the Korean title was, at that time, as you can see, How Have Accounting Dominated History? So we accounted people do not like overstating or exaggerating. So that was my first impression. But when I opened the book, I found it was a real page turner. So after, the, after closing the book, my conclusion was like this. Wow, it, what a title. And I thought it might be a really good experience to share some of the contents with my students. So actually, I began to teach you some of the contents contained in the book from 2019. So I'd like to share some of my tips from my past experience. How can you best use of this book in a regular accounting classes, not accounting history class? <laughs> uh, from uh, to my experience, it is not that efficient to cover all the contents contained in the book because the key messages are quite similar, even though the historical facts are different. So in my case, I recommend you focus on two cases if you have just a, a small number of cases. The first one is France. Why I chose France first? Because uh, you can understand the rise and fall of nation uh, following the history of Louis the Fourteenth to Louis Sixteenth, also uh, I think uh, France is not the first country who made national financial statements. But I think from the from reading the book, I felt like France is the first country who disclo disclosed the national financial statements to the public general because national finance statements was made by Corbett, who was trying to make, uh, manage the uh, fi French fiscal system. And, but in, no, Corbett, they, they care. So in, two, uh, in late 70s, uh, the country's finance condition was really bad in under, uh, Louis the Sixteenth, I guess, and then Necker wanted to do some fiscal reforms, but the resistance from the noble people was so strong. So the Necker needed some uh, document to justify his finance reforms. So he made the report to the king, and the report to the king was a sort of national finance statements, and it was made a book. And as you can guess, it became a nationwide bestseller. 
So before that report, uh, she didn't just talk about from the rumors, uh, the country did like this, blah, 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 but after reading the report to the king, uh, people began to discuss how well the country is managed with very cold and dry numbers. And they have recognized the condition of the country is so terrible, I think, and that explains this could be, uh, this functioned as a cornerstone of the French Revolution, a historically very decisive moment that switched our society to move from the medieval ages to modern eras. So by well understanding the case of the France, I think students can deepen their understanding of the role of a county system, including the financial accountability, also the role of disclosure, which is essential part of even current modern county system. Excuse me. The second case uh, I'd like to cover in class is United States history. Because as you know well, U.S. is the country that began from the beginning with a pile of huge debt due to independence war. So the country became independent from the U.K., but it was, in terms of accounting, in the condition of capital impairment, so negative equity. Uh, it might be easier to understand, right? So uh, financial accountability was really important from the beginning in the history of United States, and here, the Harris Momentum uh, put that philosophy into the uh, first article of the US Constitution. So I think this is a drastic uh, contrast to the case of French. So uh, as you might know well, US is leading country in many ar areas recently, economies, military, education, culture, et cetera. But as a social scientist, I do not argue this financial accountability would, be not, would not be the only main primary uh, driver of the U.S. success, but uh, I think the importance and role of this financial accountability reflected in the Constitution cannot be overlooked. Uh, also, uh, if you want to use some of the contents in more detail, uh, I think you can Take some, you can find some clues about the origin of double entry bookkeeping system. Uh, this photo, I, uh, Luca Pacioli, I'm not sure my pronunciation is correct, but uh, when I first learned about the accounting, the uh, faculty, the professor forced me to memorize his name in four languages. <laughs> At that time, I cannot understand why I have to memorize his name in four different languages. As much, the professor like Luca Pacioli, he explained he is the father of accounting. But by reading his book, I found the origin of double entry bookkeeping system traced back to much earlier times. So he could be the father of double entry bookkeeping system, but there could be uh, some uh, grandfather and grand grandfather. <laughs> so you can find all your answers and you can tell those findings and share with your students. Also, uh, many students are wondering why the left side is called debit side and why the right side is called the credit side. So this question might sound a little bit silly, but very important question. Also, you can find some clues from the um, first organized form of corporates, which is not stock companies. So you can find your own answer by reading this book. So, I strongly recommend to read about this book if you find these answers. And some suggestions for, for future topics. Uh, uh, after reading this book, I thought uh, the cases are very interesting, but given the fact that nationality is, is not what we can choose by ourselves. When I was born, I was Korean because my parents are Korean. I cannot change my nationality. But as you know, well, in modern capital market, in, under the globalized market system, investors can choose any companies in the world. So accounting information is often said to have two primary roles. The first one is valuation role. 
to address or mitigate the risk of adverse selection. The other role is stewardship role to alleviate the risk of moral hazard. Given the nationality is fixed or default value for many citizens, uh, historical cases covered in the book deals with uh, the moral hazard cases a lot. But recently, immigration becomes more widespread. So I think historically, there could be some cases that potentially when citizens choose their own country, I do not like my country's financial accountability. It's terrible. I move to another country. Then if there is some historic cases like that, I think it's more uh, fruitful or richer uh, cases that could be covered in the class. Okay. Second topic uh, I hope that could be covered in the future is the origin of accrual basis. Account people, everybody knows, we produce financial information on a basis of accrual. But uh, reading this book, the only form of a double entry bookkeeping system do not follow accrual basis. Uh, I got some tea from the case of US. In 1933, the generally accepted accounting principle was first made by the US after Great Depression. So in that case, I think the gap fully adopted or formally introduced the concept of accrual basis, but I do not think accrual basis just suddenly introduced to that former system. So probably there would be some cases who have deeply uh, discussed or considered about the importance of a cruel basis. I guess some tips could be from could be found from the case of railway industry. Uh, according to the book, uh, many citizens or even tax authorities in the U.S. argued that it is not it is almost impossible to understand the books of a railway industry because. Everybody think railway industry in the United States grows really fast, but they argue they failed to make profits because there was no concept such as depre depreciation at the time, which is so common nowadays. So at that time, there could be some concept of depreciation, but it was not formal. But in 1933, the GAAP system adopts it. In that case, there is some linkage. So, Jacob Saul, if you do your best and you use your ability to find such clues and uh, show us how the, the concept of accrual basis has developed over time, I think it might be a really interesting topic. So, I wrap up today's my discussion in the hope that he could write some books about the topics I raise in the future, and I'm sure I'll be a big fan of your book again. Thank you for my your attention. Thank you, Sun Yap, uh, for a great uh, discussion. Uh, he discussed about how to use uh, this book in the classroom for a regular accounting class, not uh, accounting history class. It is very uh, insightful. And also he uh, suggested two uh, our research questions. Uh, I, I hope uh, uh, Jacob will respond <laughs> to that issue, right? <laughs> And uh, let me give uh, my uh, uh, mic to Kyung Yoon. Okay, so good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me today to this prestige event. I have to say that I'm very thrilled and both very nervous to be here as a discussant because we are talking about this remarkable book by Dr. Sol. Uh, while reading this book again to prepare the discussion, I realized that I can never include such a vast amount of knowledge and um, stories that this book offers. So for today, I'd like to um, share some of my thoughts in a much narrower scope. So the keyword I got here is accountability or reading this book. Um, historically, accounting has been evolved by um, ba balancing between its role as a tool of commerce and tool of accountability. 
Um, people often understood the usefulness of the accounting as a tool of the commerce, but I feel like at the same time, they have struggled from maintaining financial accountability. And because partially that is coming from the threat as a tool of the accountability. The lesson we learned throughout the ages is that the financial accountability can be obtained when the accounting is not only used as a um, as a uh, commercial tool, but when the accounting is embraced as a part of our culture across the politics and the philosophy. Due to the various financial crises that we went through, thankfully we understand the importance of the transparency in accounting information. Um, companies provide guidance on a regular basis. The regulators are trying to help to ensure the transparency of these, all these disclosures and the communications that we are having. However, it seems like these two concepts, the accounting's usefulness as a tool of commerce and its threat as a tool of accountability, uh, it seems not well harmonized in nowadays. And thus, that's probably why we are still trying to uh, work on reinforcing this financial accountability. In particular, as the author points out in this book, there are various aspects that can pose a threat to the accountability. Um, ever, mature, ever mutating financial tools, financial instruments, they talked about the technology, more dependence on the human um, judgment on the complex accounting issues. Moreover, in the author's perspective, uh, there is increasing regulation, uh, there's more competition in the accounting firms, and they have a threat to the lawsuit. And this all challenges auditors maintaining their professionalism and financial accountability. So I pulled out some articles from the Financial Times um, to elaborate more on the current issues in audit field. Uh, last December, Financial Times reported that a number of mid-sized U.S. Um, accounting firms are actually pulling back from its audit work on the public uh, uh, companies in 2023. And one of the main reasons for that was a tougher regulatory environment. From, uh, for instance, the chief executives of the Armamina, which is one of the top 20 accounting firms in the United States, announced that because of this tightened regulatory environment and changing market condition, it, uh, it will abandon its audit work, uh, which only generates 2% of their revenue. Susan Coffey in, two, uh, in AICPA also pointed out that the PCAOB inspection is challenging auditors even more, saying that the audit accounting firms have other work that is important for their client needs. And they're now stamping back and looking at their business models and saying, what space do we want to be in? Uh, if you look at the uh, second article, the PCAOB has, in fact, taken a lot of actions to enforce audit standard under the Biden administration by increasing the number of inspections and also imposing a record fines in accounting firms. The last article also says how regulatory changes nowadays increases a burden to the auditors. Under the new standard, auditors are not only um, are required to detect and um, report the company's uh, wrongdoing that directly affects the financial numbers, but also they feel the pressure that they have to check the clients any misbehavior that might have indirect effect as well, such as putting a company at a risk of large fines. In this regard, uh, if you look at the PowerPoint slide, the center of the audit quality opposed to this plan, saying that auditors are not lawyers and that the proposal will substantially increase the cost of the audit without commensurate benefit. As we can infer from the changes of the audit industry since early 2000, today's accounting is um, based on the culture that is considered more on the revenue-oriented uh, revenue than the quality-oriented. So yes, it is not surprising at all that the accounting firms are now making decisions based on the relative cost and benefit of their audit services. We all know that auditors ensure accuracy of the financial um, statements with their competency and independency. They also work with the professional skepticism. 
with various challenges that we just discussed today, maintaining this professionalism and responsibility as an accountant and also restoring the public trust have become essential um, for the success of our society. And of course, I believe both of these can be achieved when the accounting is accepted, accepted based on the moral and cultural framework. In other words, without the full cultural engagement, neither legislation changes nor heavy sanctions or penalties will help ensuring this accountability. The full cultural engagement should exist both inside and outside of the accounting organizations. Since it's such a broad topic to, to cover it today, I would like to focus on the audit firm culture. Uh, in its report in 2014, International Auditing and Assurance um, Standard Board mentioned that the regulators are now focusing more on audit firm culture in their reviews, and that they said audit firm leadership has to implement this culture through organizational tone at the top. And since then, this audit firm culture has become the area of attention. Uh, among all that, influences the culture of the audit firm, I'd like to talk about three major areas that researchers have been investigated. Uh, those are the professionalism and commercialism, ethical culture, and culture of learning. In respect of everyone's time, I will just briefly talk about what it means. First, professionalism and commercialism. Um, historically, accountants struggled from these two somewhat conflicting values. Uh, we have seen that um, continuing tip towards the commercialism actually result in a lower audit quality. However, some of the researchers argue that since the Enron scandal, commercialistic values has been declining over time. And in fact, the professionalism and commercialism can coexist. For example, one of the Swedish study that I saw, they surveyed over 3,500 accountants and show that the big four auditors' um, prof professional identity is actually associated with the uh, firm's processes, not with the market needs or customer satisfaction. Oh, I have to go back. Okay. Um, next, I would like to talk. I would like to talk about the ethical culture and learning culture. They also play a very significant role um, defining the audit firm culture. Studies have shown that the ethical culture of the workplace actually influences the ethical behavior of the auditors. Organizations' um, ethical culture is found to induce more professional skepticism. It increases the whistleblowing. Uh, it improves work attitudes. Overall, a number of studies have found that the positive ethical tone influences the audit quality through the work attitudes of the auditors. Accounting firms' learning culture also affects the quality of the audit. Studies have shown that the auditors are more willing to speak up uh, about their audit issues, and they're willing to openly discuss any errors in the audit processes with more supportive learning environment. The learning culture is also known to influence how audit staff members learn from the audit reviews and feedbacks, and how auditors consult with the expert and the specialist as well. So establishing and maintaining a solid audit firm culture is not easy as it sounds, and also implementing this culture on the firm level, I know it is not enough at all. Um, but based on our continuous struggles ensuring the um, accountability, I believe it is meaningful for us to uh, take this opportunity to think about the importance of linking accounting in a cultural context. This is all I prepared, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Hyung Yun, uh, for uh, her great comments. Uh, she talks about the accountability, which is uh, the center of this book, especially if she talks about auditing and uh, what threats and challenges to audit makes uh, difficult to actually audit firms and audit industries and audit itself. And then to COVID, uh, the culture proper uh, creating and uh, maintaining and developing culture is uh, uh, important. I, I guess uh, how to 
create, maintain, and develop a proper culture. Uh, uh, Jacob will talk about that later on. Uh, let me uh, hand uh, my mic to Sang Ho Lee. Uh, hello, I'm Sang Ho Lee, a uh, research fellow at Korea Capital Market Institute. Uh, I'd like to start my discussion by uh, sending uh, big, big congratulations on opening KARI. And uh, it is my honor to be uh, here as a discussant of such an impressive book uh, written by Dr. Jacob Saul. And as much as I was excited to be here, uh, I was somewhat flustered when I got an uh, invitational call from Dr. Hewon Moon from KARI. First, I might be familiar with uh, discussing a research paper around 30 pages, but this was a book, uh, more than 400 pages. And second, after being told that uh, there would be only three discussants, that means we were given 15 minutes each. So uh, I wasn't sure if I could fill the time without making everyone bored. So uh, my goal for today is uh, to share two, two main questions and finish my discussion before anyone gets tiresome. All right. Uh, the first impression I got when I received the book was that uh, the title was very, very eye-catching. Uh, I am an accounting major myself, but even for me, how accounting ruled the history uh, seemed a bit exaggerated. And then I looked up the original copy and found out that the title was The Reckoning, uh, financial accountability, and the rise and fall of nations. And if it were to me, I would have probably translated the title to Yoksaya Shimpan, Historical Judgment in English, uh, But at the same time, my translated version, Yoksaya Shimpan, uh, doesn't seem like a wise marketing strategy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sincerely wish this amazing book to be a bestseller in Korea so more Koreans could share the insight of Dr. Jacob Saul uh, with an eye-catching title. But I personally, personally prefer the original title because the title itself makes me think about accountability, responsibility, and the significance of accounting. Uh, so I'd like to talk about the distance between accounting and accountability first. Uh, before I read this book, it was my understanding that accounting and accountability would be closely related in Western culture. Rather than that, uh, I expected them to be somewhat distanced in the Korean capital market because we have relatively short history. Uh, I know it sounds very superficial, but I do have the reason why I thought so. As you can see, and as you know, uh, accounting and accountability share seven alphabets, A, C, C, O, U, and T, while Hwege and Chegimsung share none. <laughs> in, the seemingly, in the more seemingly scientific uh, perspective, such as NLP, natural language process, accounting and accountability uh, have higher similarity compared to Hwege and Chegimsung. <laughs> But still, it seems that cats and dogs have greater similarity uh, after all. Uh, believe it or not, um, back to the main plot, I think that the main takeaway of this book is accountability is not something that comes for free. Not something that comes for free. Uh, account, apart from my very shallow understanding that accounting and accountability uh, would be closely related because they sound similar, but this book actually illustrates the bloody sacrifice in Western culture to bring the two worlds closer as they are now. Then it brought me to the first main question, how close are accounting and accountability in the Korean capital markets? And how accountable is the Korean accounting system? If anyone were to answer this question, what answer would be? Uh, if you ask me uh, what my answer would be, uh, I honestly do not know. But uh, one thing that I know, I do know for a fact is that we are trying in many aspects, many aspects, one being setting new regulations. Since 2018, after experiencing a series of huge accounting fraud cases, we have adopted many regulations uh, used in the developed capital markets, such as key audit matters and 
ICFR audit. Uh, not only do we rely on other market and its regulations, uh, we also added our own unique regulations, such as standard audit hour and mandatory auditor designation, which I think is a rare intervention not to be found in any other uh, capital market. However, despite uh, the efforts, we still have a long way to bring accounting and accountability close because we are still experiencing fraud and embezzlement cases even after the new regulations are uh, set into place. And uh, auditors' independence had increased a lot, but also did inefficiency in audit market as well. That being said, are we aiming, are we aiming the accounting backed by accountability? This is a related question uh, to the first main question. Uh, it is quite uncertain how to measure uh, the accountability, but what indirect evidences tell us is that it is not hard to expect uh, that accountability in Korea is not set at a reasonable level. A good example will be the sentence of uh, large amount fraud cases. The guideline for uh, embezzlement of more than uh, 200 billion, approximately uh, 200 million dollars, is uh, set between five to eight years or seven to 11 years. Even our court agrees that these sentencing guidelines are not proportional. And another example would be the maximum compensation for whistleblowing in Korea, which is two billion won at max, approximately two, billion, uh, two million dollars. If we compare that to the states, the SEC compensates whistleblower uh, with 10 to 30 percent of the entire fine, uh, with no cap, no cap. Uh, and um, the, this proportional compensation is known to encourage whistleblowing and lower the likelihood of accounting fraud by 12 to 12, 22 percent. And um, from the audit perspective, the audit market is naturally in an oligopoly uh, based on a reputational capital. That means market concentration increases up to certain points where the consequence of audit failure is fairly penalized. Because only auditors who can take the legal responsibility, legal liability, uh, will compete with each other. But the concentration of the Korean audit market kept on declining, although it is partially due to uh, auditor designation regulation. But based on these facts, I wonder uh, if we are imposing reasonable amount of accountability on our market. And moving on to the next topic, uh, as uh, Dr. Jacob Sol introduced the accounting from a historical perspective, uh, it made me compare the reckoning process of history and accounting. Uh, if we record historical events, it becomes a historical record. But even for the same historical facts, people give out different interpretations. And that is because history as a past and history as historiography are different. Similarly, uh, if there is an accounting event, we journalize it and make a financial statement and report it. And accounting also has a uh, historiographic perspective on financial statements, especially uh, accounting in Korea seems to have become accountiography uh, after adopting principle-based IFRS, as there are many interpretations on one single accounting event because these interpretations often conflict with one another, uh, it is uncertain how to impose accountability properly. So my second main question became how to reduce the gap between accounting and accountability under principle-based IFRS. As I mentioned, the stakeholders in the Korean market are experiencing conflicts uh, after the IFRS adoption. Uh, and it is well known uh, that firms, auditors, and regulators have different perspectives on de facto control and performance obligation and so forth. Once again, these conflicts uh, and disagreements make it hard to measure 
the proper level of accountability in Korea. As a result, it was one of the voices of our uh, senior members to stress the importance of balanced perspective in viewing the accounting phenomena. Uh, then, what is balanced, an objective, and fair perspective in accounting? Is there such a thing? I do not have the answer myself, but it is definitely something we should take in, into consideration in pursuing the society of accounting backed by accountability. Uh, that is all I have prepared for today, and thank you for listening. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Hang On, uh, for witty and uh, insightful comments. Uh, he started with the other title and then smart titling <laughs> and uh, talk about the accountability from the title and then talk about legal system and the order market and also uh, the, the, the comparing uh, process of history and uh, accounting and then raise a question about the balanced view of accounting. Uh, as you can uh, see, uh, they have a broad wide range of questions, uh, comments and qu questions uh, since the book is thick and then talks about a lot. Uh, so, uh, Jacob, would you, would you like to respond? Wow. Hello. Yeah, um, first, thank you so much. That was amazing. <laughs> I mean, wow. I mean, I had thought of so many of these issues and um it was all very brilliant so i'm honored um but also left i mean i don't think i should write the next one i think you should plus i'm so old now i could never do it as my days come to an end perhaps it would bring me some last sunlight if if a younger generation could take up that challenge um i think it's really interesting to talk about accounting education because that's as you saw something I brought up, it was so interesting to see how you did it. Those were great examples, but this brings us back to that point that I made, and, and you're doing this, is that if this is all gonna work, if we're gonna get accountability, if we're going to pass reforms, if we're going to establish these things, we not only need to have normal kids learning about accounting, that's very hard, by the way. I tried, we tried, we went on a big campaign um, with a lot of money behind us to try and study if people would do this. And there was a total rejection. We found that we could convince elites to do this, but not normal people. Um, elites felt more like stakeholders who would do this. But this idea of bringing the humanities back, I mean, I'm not an accountant. I'm, I'm a historian. And I worked in literature, so I know how to see a good story. I work as a journalist. And so it's writing, storytelling, um, understanding how to and this is what you were doing for students, is how to pull on people's interests. And people think that the humanities aren't important. They're absolutely key. And as I said, they used to teach accounting after the humanities, the Dutch, at this golden age moment of the Renaissance. I still think we need to do that. And I think that when we're talking about all these different challenging challenges that accounting has, you put an accountant in a room who can talk about history and who can speak. I mean, you guys do it incredibly well. I've rarely seen that in the United States, by the way, to, to have this kind of eloquence and this creativity around it. Um, this is what we need. By the way, I recommend studying um, traditional poetry. To learn, really, seriously, that's like not a joke. Um, and learning um, traditional speeches, ancient speech giving to understand how to convince people, but also just to understand these phenomena in a human way, right? And that, that brings us to auditing, which is this incredible thing. How do you get this, not only into the public culture, but how do you deal with the challenges that we're facing? And it was interesting. I mean, I, I've been dealing with this and talking to people about it, and I understand the complaints. That's one of those moments where I really get that when government brings down all these rules, then the industry just retreats because it's so scared of getting sued, right? It takes, takes on all this liability itself and it's really scary. Our problem is, and this is something I think is hard to solve, we need the public there to be asking for this and they're not. So it becomes something that is just litigational, right? And that's just a bad place for it to be. So I think that we have to take auditing out of this litigational world, but how, you know, I will say this, 
it's going to sound super stupid, but you see um, food companies advertising their food. You know, like there was this big campaign in America for milk and they just had these ads for milk and they had nothing to do with milk. Why doesn't the accounting industry advertise itself? It doesn't. Well, I talked to some people about it and they said, the more people think about us, the more dangerous for accounting it is. And I'm like, you know, that's not... And I did all this government work in Europe for major governments and I talked to major, major people within the uh, uh, accounting and auditing boards of governments of major European countries. And they said, look, do not talk about our work because either they'll shut us down or someone will come in and just take everything we've found. And I was like, you know, that's all legitimate, but if we don't actually have a risk attitude involved with this, we will go nowhere. And so I actually think that the industry, and by the way, I mean, no offense, to the industry. But if you go on their websites, at least in America, the last thing they talk about is accounting. You go on PricewaterhouseCoopers, and there's no discussion of accounting on their websites. They're going to have to own it. And they're going to actually have to sell it to the public for this to happen. And I do believe this is one of those situations. You know, there's this idea that industry is always dynamic. It's usually when their back is up against the wall, or they've completely failed. How many Account it. We went from how many bigs to big four? Are they really big four? Is it almost big three? I mean, how many big ones are we down to now, right? I believe the industry is going to have to be much more creative and daring. And it has to be entrepreneurial and risk-taking. And, and that's going to mean coming out and advertising itself and advertising these values. I'm, I don't know who else has the money or the will to do it, but we'll see what happens. Will the industry... Sustain further damage, or will it take an entrepreneurial spirit, which you could say is dangerous? But isn't this supposed to be a business? I mean, I'm like the weird, like center left wing guy who's recommending that the industry become entrepreneurial. That's a little strange. I'm like the literature professor who's saying that. That's a problem that I'm the person saying that. That's so. So this was really interesting to hear. Um, and it's really nice to hear younger people talking about this because these are other problems we're going to deal with. Um, and then we just get back to this question of accountability, right? Which is, which, you know, in the book, I describe how um, when England became the center of world accounting, and it really did. Um, we go from four accounting schools in 1706, something like four to a thousand after 1780, a thousand accounting schools in, in Great Britain. That's extraordinary. And, and, you know, I've been on all these historical discussions of why was Britain so rich? Well, it was exploiting the world and they were really good at stuff. <laughs> so it was like, not only were they stealing everything, but they were really good at things too. So that's like, you know, it's not just a negative and it's not just a positive, it's complicated. That's the way history is. But at the high point, Charles Dickens, who by some accounts could be argued to be the greatest and most influential of the 19th century novelists. And Dickens, more than any app I've seen today, I mean, taxi apps, heartbeat apps, food ordering apps, Dickens and a few other people mastered the 19th century European novel, which I believe is actually one of Europe's great achievements is the novel, right? That's something that Asia has actually adopted from, from Europe, which is useful, okay? Um, these novels were often about social inequity to bring about change. That's what Dickens was trying to do. But Dickens was the son of a failed accountant who had been robbed by a dishonest accountant. He lived and breathed accounting. So the greatest novelist, the man whose, whose novels changed the world, brought on social movements that changed things, was constantly affected and obsessed with accounting. And so when I used to teach my course on accounting and ethics, which was too hard, and it was between the business school and the liberal arts school, and the timing was wrong, and I stopped doing it, but I might start again, I would teach his, his novel, Little Dorrit, which is 700 pages to the students. Finally, students said, look, no one will ever take your course if you assign this. The novel is written with the rhythm of, of, of double entry and has this moral balancing that goes out. He's simulating the effect. This is a genius, right? He's simulating the effect of accounting, of moral accounting and financial accounting throughout the book. So how do we get to accountability? We're back to these cultural things. Um, Harvard Business School 
and Wharton both have history departments inside their schools. I'm, I'm on record as saying I don't think they're that great. They're just not great history departments because the business school, you always have to come up with the answer, the right answer in business. You, it's bad for business to come up with too many wrong answers. One of my friends at Harvard Business School actually blew the whistle on accounting standards, um, Karthik Ramana, and was fired in two weeks from Harvard Business, Harvard business School. He now teaches at the Oxford School of Government. He was out of business schools and accounting and into government schools because he, he showed how he showed how donations to Congress were basically, that was no, it was all done in darkness. The public had no idea. Accounting standards were just being written by the industry for cheap. And he was just booted out. It was like unbelievable. I lived it with him. I was like, what? It was crazy. Um, I don't know if business school should be teaching history, but I do think that they should have literature teachers. <laughs> To teach these moral questions, and to we're not going to get accountability unless it gets brought out into these things. I don't know if there's a manga or I don't. This is ridiculous, right? A K dramas on accountability. You laugh, but in the 19th century, if Charles Dickens could do it, then it could be done today. We need to do something. We need to think in these global terms. And it sounds stupid, except it was done before. I showed you this. I only showed you a little picture of the central place that accounting used to have in popular culture. And so we need to think about that. And since in Korea, you not only can think about finance, you can actually think about pioneering popular culture. I don't know how, but I do think that younger people who are interested in this, and I believe that these are existential questions, you're gonna have to think in these terms. But that doesn't necessarily mean being that revolutionary. We've done this before. I do believe we can do it again. It's just not easy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, as accountants or accounting educators, uh, we emphasize accounting is important and then it, it is the center of all businesses activities. But uh, uh, listening from a uh, historian's perspective, this sentence is, uh, makes, makes me happy. <laughs> and as Korean, actually most of Korean believe and proud of uh, uh, our ancestors invented double entry accounting uh, several hundreds ago, uh, uh, earlier than Italy. I, I'm not sure whether uh, Jacob know this or not, but unfortunately we don't have uh, a document. The earliest document is uh, only around 17th centuries, existing doc documents, but uh, most of Korean believe uh, it was invented around 11th centuries. So uh, we are all proud of that. So I guess uh, you guys uh, uh, probably from the uh, floor may have uh, a lot of questions. Uh, so, <laughs> floor에서 그뭐 카멘트나 어떤 뭐 의견이나 아니면 그 질문이 있으시면 자유롭게 뭐몇개 질문해 주시면 좋겠습니다. I have I have just one comment on Mr. Lee. Uh, you said that accountability is translated into 책임감 in Korean, but in accounting, we translate to 회계 책임감. So there are some common words between accounting and accountability in Korean too, 회계 and 회계 책임감. So don't be confused with that, that's what I wanna say. And the second one is actually a question to Professor Sol. First of all, I want to say thank you for coming to us, give us such an insightful lecture. I think it was a lecture, because you take so much things out of art and give us the implications of the art and relate that to accounting. I was so much impressed with that. Uh, but I have a, one question though. Uh, the question is, you once say that open auditing is dangerous, but you didn't say why. So I just want to give us some ideas why open auditing is dangerous. Well, first of all, so many, there's a resistance to it because it reveals secrets. And I do think, I understand the fact that for businesses and governments, 
you can reveal secrets. So you do have to be careful. So I've had discussions about this where I understand there are parts of the government that can't be audited in the same way, right? The military part. I mean, in America, you realize the size of our military budget. We use cash accounting. It's like a joke. It's, I mean, it's terrifying. Um, auditing that, there should be this, and there should be thoughts about how to do this, and there should be open discussions of how to audit things that are sensitive, and that this and. Obviously, that happens in businesses where they can't reveal all their, their their technological secrets, right? I mean, it's not like Google with AI. You can go in and audit their whole AI thing. They're smart enough that that's just impossible to do. They can't really let you do that. They'll give away too many trade secrets. So I think it is problematic, right? How do you audit a military? How do you audit a technology firm? How do you audit a security firm? Like, let's say that the securities firm is a code that no one can break. How can that be valued? And if that code, everyone's buying it, but actually it could be broken and therefore is a problem, how do you audit these things in this day of intangible assets that are often technological and numerical? So I think it's a huge challenge. Um, but those things I think can be, well, listen, we're still arguing about market to historical values. That's crazy. I mean, it's important that we argue them. I've always thought, like, why not mix them together? But we're still fighting about this stuff. So I do think that this idea of, of openness and secrecy remains a challenge. I think it's real. So I'm not naive enough to think that everything's going to be or can be in public. However, too much secrecy will stifle you. Uh, my name is Kang Yung Kim. I'm uh, also um, accounting professor um, emeritus now. But I have a question. Now, I have a question. 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 I 책이 제목이 우리 한국말로 번역이 멋있게 되어 있어서 저걸 미리 이제 읽어 보았어요. 근데 거기에 더 레코닝이라고 해서 시작을 해서 사실은 사전을 옛날에도 알고 있었지만 사전을 한번 다시 한번 봤는데 이게 사실은 아 캘큘레이션 오아 카운팅 이렇게 해 가지고 그 의미가 회계 계산 이렇게로 사실은 어 되는데 그것을 그렇게 달리 표현을 하신 어떤 특별한 의도가 있는지, 어, 그리고 다른 한 가지 더 말씀드리자면, 이, 듣고 보니까, 이, 프로페서 솔이, 아, 회계 전문가가 아니다. 나는 역사다. 히스토리언이다. 이렇게 말씀을 하셨어요. 그래서, 어, 정말 대단하시다. 아, 그런 가운데서 우리가 회계에서 오늘날 보편화되어진 가장 어려운 개념이 어 크루얼 베이시스예요. 어 크루얼 베이시스 오브 카운팅. 발생주의라고 하는 거 우리 번역을 하죠. 그런데 이 개념이 어 오늘날 일반 기업들한테는 다어 받아들여지고 뭐 하고 있지만은 어 지금 정부 회계, 가브먼트 어카운팅 쪽에서는 이 대표적인 그어 크루얼 어카운팅의 예를 들면은 펜션 어카운팅이라고요. 그 펜션 라이어빌리티를 지금 정부의 그, 어, 재무제표, 재무상대표에서는, 어, 미국도 그걸, 어, 부채로 계상을 하고 있지 않은 걸로 아는데, 그 대신 주석으로 그 펜션 라이어빌리티를 국민들한테 디스크로즈 하는 걸로 알고 있습니다. 그런데 한국은 그나마도 안 해요. 그래서, 어, 국민들한테 사실은 정부 대차 대조표, 정부 재무상태표라고 하는 것이 굉장히 왜곡된, 어쩌면은, 어, 표현이 과하지도 모르겠는데, 분식회계를 하고 있는 거예요, 국민들한테. 그래서 지금 현재의 그 부, 발생주의 회계를 정부 쪽에 그렇게, 어, 미국은 반쪽쯤 반영을 하고 있고, 한국은 그것도 안 하고 있고, 심지어는 공무원들은 
어, 회계 공부를 안 해가지고 그냥 국가 채무로만 얘기를 하고 국가 부채란 말을 안 쓰려고 합니다. 비록 우리나라 회계 그 관련 법이 있지만 국가 회계법이 있고 국가 재정법이 있어도 대수님들 그 사람들은 국가 채무만 관리하고 국가 부채는 관리하지 않는다 이렇게 해서 현재 한국의 그 국가 재무 상태표는 어 활용이 안 되고 있습니다. 그 현실을 한번 우리 아 제급 솔 교수님한테 아 발생지 회계를 어떻게 충분하게 그 동의를 하시게 됐는지 그리고 그것이 어 미국에서는 어 반쪽짜리로 그 우리나라의 그 연금 회계가 지금 재무제표에 충당 부채로 계산이 되고 있지 않거든요. 어 크루즈 라이비티로 계산이 되고 있지 않아요. 그럼 어, 거기 대해서 한번 혹시 아시는 바, 아, 미국을 중심으로 해서 본인의 의견도 좀 한번 얘기를 해 주셨으면 좋을 것 같습니다. 이상입 This, this is one of the biggest sort of questions. And actually, in America, it's one of the biggest issues between the left and the right. Um, and I come in between on this one because in America, no, the accounting is, is not good on this, all right? It's just not. And most governments are not going to be good on this. Most governments don't. Most governments don't give you. Uh, they don't give you comprehensive balance sheets. They just don't do it. Only really a few countries, and only really New Zealand actually does it. Okay, um, and now in the in this new book we have, we really discuss that in detail, and we discuss these pension issues. In America, though, I will point out that it is not a pension paid by the government. It is an insurance policy that we all pay into. So if so, so we all pay a lot of money into it, and then it goes in. One of the things that has happened, and it actually is sustainable, but the government raids it now and then. So it it takes from this. So it's actually an asset that is is abused. So to talk about it fairly, we might say I've seen calculations that say it could run out soon. Um, I've seen calculations that say. It might not run out for a longer amount of time, but it is not necessarily a liability if it is managed as it's supposed to be managed as an insurance policy, essentially. It's called social security, and we all pay into it. However, again, the government has misused it, and we don't always have an accounting of that. And by the way, conservative governments have gone into it too, to go into it, to take out of it, to say, look, it's not sustainable, and then they have free money. So this is a problem, right? And all of this needs to be out in the public. This isn't exactly the same thing, but in the crash of 2008, when Lehman Brothers went down, this was the inspiration for the reckoning. I was watching television, and I had been studying the history of accounting because I was in the archives of all these major European states at the moment they were built. And what I found is that at each moment, the most important state builders were thinking about accounting as one of the first tools of state building. I was like, this is amazing. They think like this, but we don't think like this anymore. So when Lehman Brothers happened, I'd been studying all these things that we're talking about today. And I thought, ah, oh, they're going to put the accounts up on television. The Wall Street Journal is going to publish the whole account. And we're going to see how bad these CDOs were, the, the, the credit swaps. And we're going to start to understand just how dangerous these financial markets are. Nothing. They didn't publish their accounts. I was like, wait a minute. In the 18th century, they were publishing accounts. I couldn't believe it, and that kind of pushed me to write the book. I was like, we have gone backwards. As far as the American, and I'm not going to call it a pension liability, insurance goes, they have not explained how it works. They have not explained actually how that asset, which is, which is based on these payments that we all make out of our paychecks by law, okay? So it's not technically just a liability and why it is threatening to become a liability. Now, the, it can become more of a liability also if you have a, um, a demographic crisis because future generations, current generations have to pay for older generation. There's another fascinating thing in America is illegal immigrants have to pay social security, but they don't get it. So they're the ones who are gonna pay for our social security. Um, and that's never put in these illegal immigration arguments, that you're sitting around angry about immigrants, 
getting your social security and they're the ones paying for your social security. If you did a full balance sheet, income, expenditures, assets, liabilities of social security, you would actually begin to see and broke it all down. You would begin to see how it worked. And you would precisely not say exactly what you said. Now, in Korea, I don't know how this works, but I do know that in places like Europe, um, those pensions are, people do have to pay in them too, but it's not enough. And these governments are sitting on massive, massive liabilities. I mean, look, I call this part of the, you're right. And in, in another sense, I call this part of the massive debt crisis that we're actually in, that we owe all these things and states are massively more in debt than we think because if they're going to meet these, these goals with unsustainable models, right? I think Social Security is actually one of the more sustainable um, pension systems if, it's, if we play by the legal rules. Um, but other places, for example, in Europe, I mean, it looks really bad. So I don't know what's going to happen, but I just see debt everywhere. Who owns all that debt, right? At, at least in Japan, the Japanese own their own debt. Um, but this is a big question. What would help us is to have comprehensive balance sheets. But we will not, I just don't think we're going to get them without the public getting involved. And the public doesn't even know what that means. So we're so far off from it. Again, we've studied this on how do we get people involved with this. Once again, elites are the only ones that seem to be interested in it, but even they have so many interests, right, that they don't necessarily want that either. It's very hard to get people to adopt these things. And so accountants like you, you're frustrated, rightly so, but you're talking about these immense societal and cultural problems how do we go to the next step? And that's what I've been trying to discuss. So I really understand what you're saying. But I mean, you know, in America, you know, they call it a liability. It's not technically a liability. It's an insurance scheme or an insurance program that hasn't been well managed and could become a liability. So it becomes very complicated. But again, how do we get to these discussions? What we need are accountants like you to actually have a column in a major newspaper or be on a television show so that every Thursday night you sit down and you get the accountant who's hilarious and funny, maybe extremely good looking, comes out and talks accounting to everybody. And guess what? We used to have that. We used to have the Financial Times used to have a guy, guess what his name was? Adam Smith. Adam Smith used to write on accounting in the Financial Times, and he quit in 2014, and they never replaced him. Bloomberg fired their accounting guys. I went into the Bloomberg newsroom. They, they, it was Mike Bloomberg's decision not to hire a new accounting person. It's absolutely terrifying. But I would think within a business model, someone could really sell this. The problem is I think it could be misused by a popularizer who misuses numbers, who's actually the evil popularizing accountant who actually mis misstates things. That's the other danger. So I, these are super hard questions. I mean, this is, this is, that's one of the biggest questions. And so I try and think globally about how we deal with that. And every time I think about it, I get worried. So luckily Koreans are warriors. So I feel happy to be in Korea. As I say, the most successful, worried, unhappy place in the world. Um, which is healthy in some ways. Thank you. 자, 플로어에서 혹시 그 하나나 뭐한뭐 맥시멈 두개 정도 더그 질문을 받겠습니다. 플로어에서 그냥 한국말로 편안하게 해 주셔도 좋고요. 꼭 영어로 할 필요 없습니다. Uh, let me ask one, one last question. Probably we face uh, a big challenge. Uh, you talk about, uh, we, you and we talk, talked about the financial accountability, but these days, not just financial accountability, non financial accountability is also very important, and uh, such as environmental 
and social accountability is also very important. And uh, most of the uh, nations actually force uh, the firms to disclose about the non-financial accountabilities and then to pursue those uh, how to measure and audit and then uh, report and audit is uh, quite important. Uh, what challenge and how do we, actually this is a timing to set up those systems. What do you think uh, are the most important factors to, to set up those proper uh, uh, infrastructures regarding non-financial responsibility? It's one of the hardest questions, right? Um, but it's one being thrust on accountants, which brings me, I had one more response. When things go badly, they will probably blame the accountants for it. And, and this makes me think accountants better get good at talking and good at defending themselves and good with media because when they come to the accountants, the accountant needs to immediately be able to deflect that, not sit there and read the report like this. <laughs> no way, okay? Get a good tailor, get some good friends, and learn how to talk on television. I really mean it because the day will come when those pensions go belly up and they're going to, I just dawned on me, who are they going to blame for this? There's going to be some account and they're going, Ugh, and they're going to blame them. Okay. They're going to, that's, they'll blame politicians, but you can go after accountants. Oh, the non-financial assets. I mean, this is a, a rough one to give to the accountants, right? Mm -hmm. um, because of course uh, you get blamed once again, how do you account for things? Everybody's greenwashing, that's for sure. I mean, that's the newest. I mean, most of this stuff is now greenwashing. I, it's almost impossible, by the way, to actually do something that doesn't hurt the environment. It's really, really hard. We don't actually have energy systems up and running in a full-scale way. Look, who's responsible for this pen when it ends up in the Pacific Ocean? All right, I'm just telling you, all this stuff's gonna end up in the Pacific Ocean. It, it freaks me out. Just to see all these bottles makes me nervous. I'm from California, all this is illegal there now. So I come out, I see all the plastic, I freak out. But who's morally responsible? How do we deal with non-tangibles, emissions, moral problems? The fact is though, we have been dealing with this. And in the new book that we've written, um, we're talking about not just really thinking about liabilities, but thinking about our assets. We don't even think about our assets well. And that's what the book is kind of about, is talking about public assets. Um, so I do think when my co-authors were um, approached, and they're, they're the pros, it means these guys are some of the best accountants, mm -hmm. and Ian Ball is probably the greatest public accountant in many ways because of the reforms he did. He's a historic figure who's still alive. Okay? And he did the New Zealand system. It's amazing. That guy is amazing to work with him. For me, as a historian, I'm like, I'm working with the, with the guy. He's very opposed to this because he's an old-fashioned, serious accountant. And he's like, this is really hard to do. The one point that I make that he agrees with is we can't even do the basics yet. So careful on asking us to go further, right? Like, you haven't even asked us to do accrual for the government and we're still arguing over historical and market mark to market value, and you want us to put all these intangibles all on there, that's really hard. And yet, they're already kind of there, aren't they? I mean, at the end of the day, um, I do think it's gonna be young people, they're gonna get mad when these pens up ruining, you know, end up ruining their lives or making it so you can't have fish or meat or everything's filled with microplastics, right? I read an article vaguely this morning with jet lag about the nightmare of microplastics that we're in, right? Who's responsible for that? Those companies are reaping great profits. How do those go on balance sheets for all the damage when we're still trying to study microplastics? And they're laughing because we haven't yet established it. So there's no legal way to put the danger of microplastics onto balance sheets, right? Because we don't technically know if they're dangerous. They can't be that great for you. Let's be honest. So, but we're gonna have to start thinking and that means being creative. I've often thought of multiple sets of balance sheets, which is the old traditional way. In, in Italy, you had the balance sheet you kept for your business and then the one you showed to, your, to the government for your taxes in the 1300s, right? Um, and the way the government dealt with it was if they felt it was a legitimate level of cheating, they considered it okay, they knew you were cheating, you just couldn't cheat too much. Things haven't changed that much, right? Um, 
So for me, you will have a balance sheet that we could call traditional, and then maybe another balance sheet that you could have your ESG uh, uh, things on, which interestingly enough, will be far more interesting to the public. And so that is a real pressure point. Um, those stories are more interesting than the financial stories, which the public just simply can't understand. But once you start actually, do you, do you guys know, obviously, that in European accounting, narrative accounting existed really until the late 18th century, the, the early 19th century, that you actually wrote your accounts out in a, in a story with the account book there. So the balance sheet would be there. Often there would be stories attached to it to explain it. And I feel like that's what we're, this goes back to what I was saying. There's going to have to be a story balance sheet about your, you know, non-tangibles or these other bigger issues. And then there's just going to be your plain old balance sheet. One thing I do think, and I've noticed this with younger generations and the press, is that when you're talking about ESG, people get much more interested than when you're talking about assets and liabilities financially in a pure sense. If people are smart and if companies are smart, they're supposed to be smart. So let's see that happen, then they could actually leverage this. So if you're a young entrepreneur in accounting and you want to get really rich and change the world, maybe for the best, maybe you could do this, is start actually saying, our company is going to hand you different kinds of balance sheets. And guess what? We're going to hire these brilliant, brilliant young humanities grads. And actually, we're going to start asking them to learn accounting. We're going to work with them to do these multiple sets of balance sheets. And we're going to provide that to your company. You can use that or you can just use it as publicity and you can win. So there is always a, an answer to this. It's not some communistic thing. You can go and make money off of this. I, these are business opportunities. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but I kind of see that. Th it's time to like, it's time for creative thinking, you know? Thank you. It, uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, he will give another lecture about the current and future, right? And I, I'm so excited about the, uh, tomorrow's lecture. Uh, and also, I sp uh, especially thank Jacob again uh, for coming here to celebrate uh, uh, Korean Accounting Research Institute and also giving uh, this great lecture. Thank you so much. <laughs>